Right. It seems the students are much better in, in terms of technical. <laughs> I mean, they know how to pick at least few. Yeah, mashallah, the new to take picture. <laughs> When you have a question, you ask the youngest child. The yeah. youngest ah, child will, yeah. will answer. <laughs> uh, Harif, you let me know when we are ready huh, to start and when students start entering in. You know, the students are coming. Yeah, the number is increased. So, well, the students are already coming. Right. It's up to you, doctor. If you want to start now, we 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 also have start our live Facebook live. Excellent. So I can start, right? Yes. Okay. If you can just send me the picture in WhatsApp. Can I right. Ask? Send it now. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, assalamu alaikum uh, wa rahmatullah. Uh, dear uh, professors, doctors, <coughs> academic staff of uh, the International uh, Islamic University Malaysia, uh, uh, researchers, uh, students, uh, welcome to this online lecture that we're doing today about the Quranic concept uh, of uh, history. <coughs> uh, we are doing a session today, uh, a lecture today, with a very honored uh, scholar of uh, Islam, uh, Professor Dr. Jasser Auda. Uh, Professor uh, Jasser Auda is a scholar of uh, Islam. Uh, at present, uh, he is the president of the Makassid Institute, and uh, uh, he has a long history in the in studying of the Quran and the the the, the tradition or the history of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, uh, the Makassid Institute, for which I, I, I hope uh, Dr. Jasser can probably give us a short introduction, <clears throat> is, a, is, a, is a global institute and a think tank registered institute, uh, which deals with uh, research and education projects in uh, a number of countries. Dr. Jasser is the Al Shatib Chair uh, uh, for Makassid Studies at the International. Uh, Peace University in South Africa, a founding and board member of the International Union uh, for uh, Muslim uh, Scholars, uh, an executive member of the FIC Council of uh, North America, a member of the European Council for Fatwa and Research, and chairman of the Canadian FIC Council. So as you can see, it, <coughs> uh, he is one of the persons who, from whom me as Canadian that I am, uh, take fatwa whenever we need something in uh, North America. Uh, 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 Professor Auda has a PhD in, uh, he has two PhDs actually. Uh, one is in the philosophy of uh, Islamic law from University of Wales, United Kingdom, and has a PhD in system analysis from the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. Uh, something that <clears throat> is very special about Professor Jasser Auda is that he is also a Hafiz. He's a memorizer of uh, the Quran. And for <clears throat> uh, those students who uh, take uh, courses about Muslim nations with me, uh, 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 they know what the Hafiz is. We dealt with that during our first uh, week and lecture in our course when we dealt with the history of uh, uh, Islam <clears throat> and uh, the importance that Quran has in the establishment of uh, 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 religion of Islam. Uh, uh, Professor Auda is also <clears throat> uh, undertook uh, also traditional studies at the famous uh, Al-Azhar uh, uh, Mosque in Cairo. And he has worked in his life at, at uh, various very uh, different uh, famous universities like Waterloo, Ryerson, Carleton in, in Canada, Alexandria University in Egypt, Faculty of Islamic Studies in Qatar, American University of Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates, University of Brunei, and you name it. <clears throat> we are really, really honored to have Professor Auda lecture to us today. Uh, I mean, he has held lectures on Islam in so many countries, has written more than 25 books in Arabic, 
and uh, English, and some of his books have been uh, uh, translated, imagine it or not, up to 25 languages. Now, <clears throat> how did we come uh, to, to, to Professor Auda? Well, it was an accident. I, I've heard of, of, of Professor Auda uh, a lot, but uh, I didn't have the chance to know him personally. But uh, together with uh, Dr. Alvi and other uh, 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 lecturers at the Department of History, this semester we're teaching this course, which is the introduction to the history and the civilization. And uh, in this uh, introductory course that we teach, uh, I explained to my students so many things. I dealt with the notion of history, how history uh, 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 became in a way a science by ancient Greek historians. We, we dealt with Herodotus and others, we dealt with Cicero, we dealt with the ancient Greeks, the Romans, and also we dealt with uh, uh, what history is, is about. And uh, as I mentioned to my students, Historia Magistra Vitae, history is the teacher of life. Now, me myself coming from a, a European and North American background, yeah, and coming uh, from a, a secular universities. I mean, I did my PhD in Florence at the European University Institute, which is very, very secular. Even, I mean, uh, e there is no even Christianity in my university where I studied, even though my university in Florence was in a church complex and we made many of our classes in a, in a very uh, wonderful uh, capellas from the, uh, uh, the Medici family that were built in Florence, still <clears throat> uh, there is always a need to bring religion back to our discussion. And uh, to our students uh, during the third week of uh, uh, our classes, uh, we dealt with the Islamic concept of uh, history. So what does uh, Quran tells us? Because uh, we have a Marxist school, we have a secular school, we have imperial school, we have the ancient Greeks. And uh, of course, uh, during uh, our courses, we're going to deal with a number of civilizations. But then the question with my students came <clears throat> to the Quran. What does the Quran tell us? Uh, do we Muslims believe uh, in Darwinism? Uh, do we believe that we come from monkeys? Of course not. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us another worldview. And with the discussions that I had with my wonderful students, which I hope that I, they are all here, because if they're not here, I'm going to question them and ask them uh, next week when we have class together, and they will have a very hard time by my questionings. I pray that they are not here listening to me now. So <clears throat> in our discussions with the students, I mean, we dealt with a, with, a, with a question of what is our Islamic worldview? And of course, we as Muslims know that our basic is the Quran, which is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the holy word which our uh, mighty God uh, revealed to our prophet through angel Jibril. And here is where we as Muslims had our root. We spoke about the Christian perspective, about the Jewish perspective, and we showed in a way how our Islamic perspective is different from the Christian and Jewish one. Even though we all come from monotheistic religion, we have a different narrative. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we came from Adam and Hava. Allah created us in Jannah. Shaitan uh, made the first fitna against us. Our great grandfather repented. Allah brought him in our planet. And then Allah told us that throughout history, he would bring to us prophets who are going to show us the way. There is a divine plan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe that there was a creation, <clears throat> there was a beginning, and there is an end. There was the first creation, the, 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 the incident with shaitan, our continuation in this planet, and then you will have the day of judgment, the end of everything. Now, uh, when I was searching on the internet <coughs> about uh, some uh, Muslim intellectuals who uh, will deal with the concept of uh, history according to the Quran, I found a very wonderful video of uh, Professor Jasser Auda and that I shared it with my students. The video was fantastic. And then I said, let's have a look uh, if I will have the chance 
to find this uh, uh, wonderful person and to see, I mean, if uh, uh, we can have him join us. And by Googling, uh, it was the Kader of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the destiny. I found him, I sent him one email and Professor Jasser was a, a, a very humble person. He said, yes, I can join you. And this is El, El Nihaya, and we will talk about El Bidaya. So the big, uh, correct me, Professor Jasser, because my Arabic is, is, is horrible. And this is how it all started. So uh, dear students and, 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 and colleagues who are, you are, who you are following this uh, discussion, here we have the honor to have uh, uh, Dr. Jasser Auda to talk to us, to lecture to us about the Quranic concept of history. Dr. Uh, Professor Auda, thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Allah bless you, Allah bless you. MashaAllah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala as'adi khalqi wa khatam rusuli Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa radiyallahu ala muhajirin wa al-ansar wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen. Thumma amma ba'd. My dear uh, Professor Olsi and my dear Professor Alvi, I am really uh, honored that you invited me. Uh, to this class. It's always a breath of fresh air to be in a classroom with students who are students of knowledge, who would like to learn about knowledge. And it is more of a, of a fresh air when the question is about the Quran and about uh, how the Quran relates to disciplines and studies and a, a deeper and serious look at the research we do uh, it's always a pleasure. And assalamu alaikum to all of my brothers and sisters uh, at IIUM. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the Canadian capital, Ottawa, but inshallah, uh, I visit IIUM all the time, inshallah. Uh, uh, hopefully soon uh, the travel and the health situation of the world will allow us to be back in Malaysia and to visit you, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. I will uh, give a presentation to answer this question about the concept of history in the Quran. I did not write uh, particularly on this in, in my writings, except for uh, sections in some of my books where I deal with history, uh, whether the history of Muslims, uh, how we can divide it, uh, the history that relates to Hadith, since I deal with Fiqh, and fatwa and so on. Of course, uh, anybody who deals with fiqh and fatwa has to be somebody who memorizes the Quran. But then with the Quran, when you approach the hadith, you have to deal with a lot of history there. Uh, when you deal with hadith, and it's not straightforward, it's quite complex, because uh, the books of hadith, as you all know, are not exactly like the Quran. The Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have it as it is. The books of hadith are narrators. Some of them were honest, some of them were liars, and some of them had mixture of motivations, and it gets complex, and there's a lot of history. So that's part of my, if you wish, take on history that has to do with the application on hadith. And um, nowadays that I am busy uh, with uh, the Quran and the Quranic studies, uh, the question of history comes uh, all the time. I'm dealing these days in one of my writings with the story of Adam that uh, Prof. Olsi um, alluded to um, Adam al -asma kullaha. Allah taught Adam all the names so uh, his introduction is very fit with a Quranic approach to history because uh, we know that we started with Adam we did not start uh, with you know primitive life and, and then evolved uh, to that um, the issue of evolution is more complex than that but I'm just talking about the creation uh, of Adam uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know that uh, we started with a language and we have it in the Islamic history as the Arabic language or a, the, the, the initial Arabic language. You see, there are two le levels. We can talk about that. Uh, but Allah taught Adam all the names. Uh, he did not uh, send him with a proto-language or with an ape-like kind of mind or any of that. Uh, we, we came to this earth with a deen, with the Tawheedullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is Islam. So Tawheed, or the oneness of Allah, was not an invention of the pharaohs, uh, and law was not the in an invention of the Iraqis, and this kind of thing. Of course, we came down with a language, and a law, and a religion, and everything uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us 
So we do have a different narrative of history. The question today is, is the Quran and the concept of history itself. Do we have a concept of Islamic history in the Quran? And the answer is no, actually. We, the Quran doesn't talk about Islamic history. The Quran talks about history. But is the Quran a history book? So let me share with you, and the answer again is no, but let me share with you some of my thoughts here that I put in some slides. Uh, I thought, well, since it's a classroom, let me uh, give some slides so we can have some notes. Now, uh, it's about the Quranic concept, or in Arabic would be the mafhum, a tarikh. Uh, so tarikh itself is not a Quranic word. It's an invention. So when we talk about tarikh, it is something that we invented. It is not uh, revealed as a concept. But the meaning of a tarikh or the, you know, the, the stories is, is the Quranic concept. So the Quran talks about al-qasas or about the stories in this case. And the Quran does have a couple other levels of history that I will, inshallah, uh, talk with you about. So I will quickly, inshallah, go through six points. Uh, Quran on history, what exactly is the Quran saying on history at a higher level of thinking. And I will introduce a methodology and framework that we work with in the Maqasid Institute that uh, uh, Dr. Olsi uh, introduced. Uh, it is a think tank uh, with a number of branches and projects in different countries where we take an Islamic methodology or a Quranic framework to disciplines. That is the disciplines that people developed, such as history and architecture and environmental studies and a number of other disciplines that we work with as a research center. Um, and we take the same methodology to phenomena studies that are uh, current studies of the world and uh, where we are going. And we take the same methodology to what we call usuli studies or the studies of the basic sciences uh, of Islam. So I will introduce quickly the methodology and framework where I come from when I speak about the Quran. And then I will uh, take four points uh, in terms of Quran and history. One, the scope of history in the Quran. What is the Quran talking about when it talks about history, to the impact of falsehood on writing history. The Quran is telling us that some of the great prophets of Allah, their history is forged or was forged by the followers of the followers and the generations to come. And the Quran takes a task to correct uh, falsehood in history. And therefore we learn a lesson from that so that we can uh, we know that not every history book that we open is telling us the truth. In fact, mostly they are um, certain ideologies and ideas with bits of truths here and there that we have to fish for uh, as we try to look for a truth. Um, the rise and fall of the Ummah, how we see it, of course, this is a whole different lecture or a course, but I will give a highlight on, through my writings, how I divide the different stages that the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, went through, uh, different from the usual division of stages that we find in history books, uh, such as the great historians of Islam, you know, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Kathir, Al-Tabari, and so forth. They divide history in a different way from the way that I would divide history based on the methodology that is based on the Quran that I will tell you about. And then finally, my perspective on what is needed in terms of research uh, on history from an Islamic point of view. Um, when I give a lecture to a history department like yourselves or a lecture to a department of architecture on the Islamic perspective on architecture or a lecture uh, in a department of political science on an Islamic Quranic um, theory of hukum or governance or a lecture on uh, economics um, in terms of people asking a question, what does the Quran say about um, property or about the role of state in economics? Or a, I give a lecture in any other disciplinary uh, academic institute uh, like yourselves, I'm always asked this question. Um, the Quran is not a book of economics. So why are you talking to us about economics from the Quranic perspective? The Quran is not a book of architecture or engineering. The Quran is not a book of arts. Uh, the Quran is not a book of history. 
So do you, are you saying that the Quran is a book of history? And the answer is no, because these sciences are sciences we develop. They are human sciences. The Quran is Allah speaking, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is much higher than any science we have. So we used to call it alchemy, and then it developed and became chemistry. And now we have biochemistry and organic chemistry, and chemistry itself is multidisciplinary. And now there, are, there is chemistry that has to do with quantum physics. So science is developed. We don't uh, have a classification of sciences that is fixed in Islam. And Allah did not fix that, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he's letting us to develop sciences along history. So the Quran is not a book of science in that sense, but it is a book that defines the framework for science, any science not just religious sciences. In fact, this religious versus secular sciences is not Islamic and not just social sciences. The Quran does have things to do with design and engineering and applied sciences and humanities and so forth. Uh, many scholars focus on the Quran and social sciences only. So politics and economics and law, but no, the Quran is um, the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to give us a framework, to give us a worldview, what we call in Arabic in the fiqhi language, at tasawwur How do you conceptualize things? That is the role of the Quran. If you want to speak, uh, you know, Latin, we're talking about the epistemological and ontological levels of the study, but I don't speak this language. I will speak about ilm, which is a different concept uh, in Islam from epistemology and ontology. And ilm has to do with um, a message that Allah sends through a prophet so that we have a, a knowledge from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowledge at the basis of our knowledge, uh, at the basis of our definition of things, at the basis of our values, uh, at the basis of our processes as we think in terms of the dynamics of, of any knowledge. So therefore, is history a science in that sense? The Quran tells us that history is part of ilm. And there is a difference between ilm and science. Uh, science, people, uh, when they label something a science and they put an uh, epistemological basis for it, they define science, like in our current times, as a silo, as a, a, a domain that is usually disconnected from the other domains. So people speak about history, and rarely where you find a scholar connecting history with geography and science and economics and sociology and religion and so forth, like in, their, in the Western, um, not Western, secular sense. Uh, I speak from the West here anyway. This is a Western approach, but it's not a secular approach. So my point is that um, history in Islam is part of ilm, but it is not a science that is disconnected from other sciences. You really cannot study history uh, on its own without bringing so many other dimensions of history. In other words, the Quranic view of uh, studies and knowledge is not a disciplinary view. The Quran deals with phenomena and deals with phenomena at a higher level of, if you wish, transdisciplinary approach. Um, and, and Muslim scholars in the Islamic civilization who were influenced by this paradigm of the Quran, they, yes, they specialized in medicine or um, the astronomy or architecture, but they did not sever the ties between these sciences and the Quran, and they did not sever the ties between these sciences and other sciences. Uh, you will find their books on uh, mathematics, not just pure mathematics, but getting into applied mathematics. And even when they speak about mathematics at an abstract level, they are actually dealing with uh, the philosophy of it. And they don't de de define mathematics or uh, architecture or, or jurisprudence as a silo. Uh, this happened later in our history in the time of the decline of the civilizations, when the disciplines became monopolized by people of interest. 
And therefore, um, we started to say, oh, no, this is fiqh. Uh, don't tell me about hadith. No, this is just, this is only fiqh. I cannot uh, transgress uh, the border of fiqh into hadith or Quranic studies. Or uh, this is a doctor. He should not be talking about anything else but surgery and medicine and, and remedies because uh, you, you cannot have a, a, an Averroes, a multidisciplinary doc, a doctor like Ibn Rushd, who was a doctor and a philosopher and a judge. And, and he did not see these as different silos, uh, but actually connected all of this in his philosophy and his approach. So Quran defines the framework of studying any discipline. And this is how we can study disciplines from the Islamic perspective. As an Islamic university in IIUM, you are taking an Islamic perspective. When you deal with the Islamic perspective of things as your professors are teaching you, uh, do not think that you are bringing religion into a different discipline because in Islam, it's not like that. In Islam, everything is religion. Everything is deen because deen is a way of life. So is there a concept of Islamic history in the Quran? No, there is just a concept of history that we can read. Allah did not say tarikh in Arabic, but he told us many things that we could read as history or perceive as history. Uh, let me start with the method where I'm coming from. I just published a book, actually launched it yesterday in IIUM uh, with, uh, I mean, your, your rector, uh, of the university honored me by uh, launching the book and uh, a number of my ustads there, uh, Prof. Asman Bakr and uh, uh, Dr. Abdelaziz Barghouti and others. So we just launched this book yesterday and it's called Re-Envisioning Islamic Scholarship. Uh, in terms of Islamic scholarship, we do need to restructure, to re-envision, to renew. Uh, it is essential that we take a methodology and I will give a very quick outline. It's a long story. We spent four hours talking about this methodology yesterday in the seminar. But uh, the methodology says, if you want to take steps to studying something from a Quranic perspective, which is what I took roughly in order to give you this lecture, one is to have a purpose to define your purpose from the study, not problem definition, because problem definition is problematic uh, because you don't have a framework yet, which is step number three here. If you start by defining a problem, you are going to fall into methodological errors because you have not built a framework of understanding the issues yet, defining the issues. You should start with a purpose, with an intent. So our intent here is to explore history in the Quran. Uh, we are not dealing, we are not coming from a particular problem of um, civil coexistence or whatever problem of uh, educational institutes or any of that. We are just, we have a purpose of trying to take uh, what the Quran made a purpose of history, which is Ibra. Ibra is lessons, um, examples, uh, universal laws. You understand something by having this purpose. We go to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'll speak a little bit about hadith too, in terms of cycles of reflection. So read the Quran from the beginning to the end. If you are uh, per a person who uh, learns the language of the Quran, you read it in Arabic. If not, you read it in any other translation, which is an interpretation, but it captures the meanings uh, or one of the meanings anyway. So when you read the Quran uh, in any language, I'm not talking here about uh, Arabic or fatwa, I'm talking about history. And therefore, when you read the Quran, even in English or in Malay, you will start to see history. Uh, th these are the stories and that's what happened. Uh, I could differ with the translator or the other about the translation of some of the words, but the translation is pretty much the meanings of what the Quran is telling you. So don't make language a barrier from dealing with the Quran, whatever language you can open the Quran and deal with. But then when you read the Quran with the eyes of historians, like your professors here, you will see different things because the eyes of the historian will read something different from the eyes of a political scientist, from the eyes of a jurisprudence uh, law guy like myself. When I read, I read law. Um, or uh, from the eyes of a scientist who is busy with certain things, the eyes of a psychologist, different from the eyes of 
a person who is on the ground uh, feeding the hungry or a mother who is very much into the life of her children. When you read the Quran, you see different things uh, or a father for that matter. You see different things. And when you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, in relation to the Quran, uh, history aside for now, you will see that the Prophet وسلم, is an illustration of the Quran. He is what they call in Arabic, the Quran calls in Arabic, bayan. Bayan is an illustration, is an example. So that you illustrate for people. So you are looking for leadership in the Quran. He is the perfect leader, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You are looking for uh, family dynamics in the Quran. He is the perfect husband and perfect father and perfect grandfather and so forth. Now, based on that, you build a framework. And what is suggested in the uh, Maqasid Institute as a framework is a number of elements that uh, if, you, uh, okay, if you look at them, you will start to see um, a concept of, of the, the, the area that you are researching. Uh, we're starting with the objectives uh, because this is an objective-based uh, research and I could explain some more about that. Uh, and that's where the word maqasid came from because maqasid are the objectives. So when you look at the objectives of history uh, and the questions of why, of the stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the book, you start to see the wisdoms behind the historical accounts that the Quran is giving us. You will start to define certain concepts. One of the most interesting concepts when you look at the Quran with historical perspective is the concept of time. Because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give us dates in the Quran. There is no uh, 1000 BC or CE or Hijri or Miladi. It's not about that. He's saying that there are 12 months in a year. And then the time is so relative. It's sometimes one day for a thousand days and one day for 50,000 years. Uh, and and, uh, and Laylatul Qadri Khairu min Al Fishahr, 1000 month. Um, and then there is no dates. There is before and after only. Uh, and when you look at the Quran this way, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us history, not in terms of the superficial things. It doesn't matter uh, 500 or 600 years ago, perhaps. Um, it doesn't matter the artifacts, the zukhruf, what the Quran calls the ornaments, are not as important as the rise and fall of people's behavior and civilization and morality. And before that, faith. The rise and fall on history is the rise and fall uh, in faith. And the story of history in the Quran is the story of faith, is not the story of castles and battles and dynasties. And that is a different concept. So that's, for example, the concept of time, the concept of history. When you uh, look at the groups, uh, uh, proofs has to do with fallacies and all of that and make sure, making sure that you establish the right argument and the right logic. When you look at the different groups, how do you classify groups in history? The Quran is saying that there are believers and disbelievers and hypocrites, and there are corruptors and there are reformers, and there are people who fight for the truth and people who fight for the falsehood, and people who uh, establish powers for the sake of establishing justice and people who establish powers for the sake of their selfish uh, aims and so forth. And these groups the Quran is defining for us should reign over our definition of groups and our classification of tribes and so forth as we go forward. Um, if you start to classify troops, uh, groups in terms of blood lineages, uh, yes, the Quran does some of that, but this is not the basic uh, definition of um, parties in history. Uh, parties in history are not defined in terms of lineages only, but they are also defined in, or they are basically defined in terms of where they stand uh, related to the truth. Um, when you look at uh, the universal laws, this is a, a major part of the framework of history. This is the highest level of history where universal laws uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us as sunan al ilahiyya in the Quran it calls uh, it as sunan al ilahiyya the traditions of Allah, not the traditions of anybody else. So how he 
made history in cycles. These days we alternate amongst people. Uh, people who tell us that history is just a linear progress of civilization and uh, there is no cycles there um, versus the others who don't believe in creation and that's everything is cycles. Like these two extreme and illogical uh, ways of looking at history, the Quran is telling us it's a bit more complex than that. There are cycles within cycles and some people rise and fall quickly and some people rise and fall uh, it more it take more time in history, and uh, some peoples uh, change their ways and they develop their civilization to become better, and therefore they rise again. And if the people of the towns believe in Allah and have taqwa, heedfulness, have good deeds, if they are righteous, Allah said He He will open the doors of uh, providence from heaven to them. Uh, providence is a huge concept too, if we're talking about concepts in history. And people who talk about a material interpretation of history, they have a different take on providence, uh, a different take on wealth and how it is. Allah talks about rizq, which is a very different philosophy there and a very different concept if you look at that. Um, to go back quickly to this, when you go and now look at critical studies, would be after you build a framework, you start to compare an Islamic approach, which is your approach now with other people and to have a critical approach. And therefore this will give you those formative theories and principles by which you can govern your understanding of history uh, or any discipline for that uh, matter. Now, if we uh, move quickly to the scope of history then I, took out the, the word Islamic because we don't have an Islamic history in the Quran. History is history. And Islam has a perspective on that history, whether it is the history of earth or the history of animals and plants or the history of civilizations or the history of Muhammad وسلم, or Isa or Musa. There is no Islamic history of Isa versus a Christian history of Isa. There is the history of Isa, and there are people who change the history of Isa to become something else. And we are carriers of the truth as Muslims. This is what we believe. People could believe in whatever else, but we have the right history of Adam and Isa and Musa, and all of them are prophets of Islam anyway. So when we say Islamic history, this is not versus any other religion because the religion with Allah is Islam. And yes, people invented other religions based on their uh, deviations or what the Quran calls tahrif al-kalimi an mawadi'i, the deviations of the words from their places. So they worship the sun and the moon and they worship Jesus and uh, they worship the, the golden calf, whatever they want to worship. But Islam is the deen and the religion of Musa and Isa and Muhammad and Adam and Nuh. And therefore we don't have this Islamic history. The time scope has different levels, if you wish. Uh, th th this is parallel to some of people who uh, who, who talk about the, the macro kind of view of history. The universal laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, are very important to study in order to understand history from an Islamic perspective. Uh, I mentioned one of them, which is a tadawul or the cyclical alternation of power. I mentioned uh, also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish uh, those who deviate from the path of the truth and corrupt earth. Uh, earth will reply back with corruption. When we corrupt earth, earth is not going uh, in, in the right natural way and therefore we suffer and therefore our civilization has to go and another civilization has to come where people do not corrupt earth as much as we do. This is a universal law and so forth. So the universal laws of diversity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us different. We will always have different tongues and different colors and different nations. And this is also part of the universal law. And there is no uh, single you know, race that should dominate or any of that. It's not about races and it's not about colors. It's about the truth. So universal laws at that level. And then the Quran is talking about communities. 
Ya Bani Israel, there is a whole history of the children of Israel in the Quran. And the Quran is not dealing with this in a simplistic or binary way. Uh, some of them are believers, some of them are not. Uh, some of them worshipped idols, some of them followed Musa all the way to the end. They sacrificed their life for the truth. And some of them after Musa changed their religion, and some of them after Musa continued with the religion until they believed in Jesus, Sallallahu And then after Jesus, the followers of Jesus is another community. Uh, some of them continued on the truth, and they were persecuted. They appeared in the prophet's letter to Hercules when he told him about the Arians. And some of them um, became Christians and therefore worshipped the cross and the church and all of that. And the Quran is telling us that. This is not my narrative. It's how the Quran is defining a framework for that community. So universal laws is a higher level of dealing with history. The communities and how they developed over history is another level. And then you have the level of events, al-qasas, uh, the stories, uh, which, as I mentioned, are events usually without dates uh, when you look at that. And the geographical scope of history in, Isla in the Islamic pers perspective is not Arabia and what's around Arabia and sometimes rarely some historical studies of Africa or a little bit on the Malays or a little bit on the, you know, the former Soviet nations, the, the Uzbek and so forth and the Kazakh, the, like in the Tatarians, etc. It's not like that. The history in the Quran is not Arab centered, is not even human centered, actually. Uh, but if you look at our accounts of history, you will find it very much Arab centered. It's rare that you find um, history books that deals with the wider ummah of Islam. It's even rarer to find history books that deals with Islam in Africa or in Europe or in North and South America. And there was a lot of Islam there. And there is an existence of Muslims in the Americas from the first century Hijri. We have accounts for that um, and from the Andalusians and the Africans. But this was not studied because the secular dogma had changed the study of history to become a secular study. This is part of what colonization did in the Muslim world, the Muslim parts of the world, when the colonizers started to change knowledge to become secular knowledge and therefore define an Islamic knowledge and a technical or dunya, deen and dunya kind of knowledge. That is a secular uh, approach to knowledge. Uh, when you have an Islamic knowledge uh, if you want to study Quran or Hadith, or but if you want to study history, you study it secularly. If you want to study medicine or architecture, you go and study the secular theories uh, of uh, history. That is a division that Islam does not know. Islam does not deal with Islam as a geographical area or as a race. Uh, Islam is the truth wherever it is. Uh, there is truth in Europe and in Africa and in China and in America all the time. And there are Muslims all the time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, there is no ummah, there is no community without a warner, without a prophet. And that is a different take on history. The Islamic history is not post Muhammad only, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but Islamic history is before Muhammad too. That is also Islamic history. Um, quickly, the falsehood uh, has a role in writing history, because uh, as we all know, in the in the like the, the normal say that history is written by the victorious. It's very true, and the victorious um, usually control authority and wealth and media, and that is what writes history. Let's see how history is written now uh, in the curricula books and so on in some Arab countries or some. Let's see how they write history and to see how authority media and wealth actually rewrites history as we speak these days you know things that happened 10 or 20 years ago how it is rewritten uh, look how uh, china is rewriting history in terms of uh, the the uyghurs for example and i know your your prof here is interested in this topic and advocated for it um they're forging history this is not how this uh, region has developed uh, if you're looking at the truth. So the falsehood does forge history. 
And this has impacted the Prophet's histories big time. Uh, the Quran is correcting some of this and had impacted what we know as what we call Israeliyat or the Israelite narrations. In some of the tafsirs, you find that the prophets are doing things that are not supposed to be done by prophets. Where did this come from? The Quran is not saying anything negative about prophets, but you find that some of the mufassirin, some of the tafsir scholars had taken narrations from other nations that altered the word of Allah and altered their history of the prophets and the truth. And therefore it becomes quite problematic when you see a story in the tafsir that makes, uh, let's say Prophet Dawood uh, a sinner, basically like any lay person who just does whatever. And of course not. The Prophet Dawood is one of the great prophets of Islam and he is not supposed to do that. And therefore we need to look at the historical accounts with an Islamic perspective from the Quranic perspective critically. And we should not shy from saying that this imam or that imam made a mistake when they include something in the historical accounts that the Quran is against. Because the Quran is not coming from a human perspective. The Quran is from above, is divine. Uh, yes, every history is a perspective of the historian, they say, but the Quran is not a perspective. The Quran is the word of truth, is the only actually truth we have uh, in terms of talk. Uh, what about the historical narrations of the hadith? That is a long story that could take a long lecture or perhaps a course. But I would also want to note here that historical studies are very important for hadith studies. When is the hadith narrated and why is it narrated this way? And especially specialized people of jurisprudence like myself, when we deal with hadith and you put all the five, seven narrations of hadith in one page, you see them contradictory. You see them narrating different histories sometimes because the narrators are different, have different perspectives and different biases. And the impact of history on hadith, in this latest book, I talk about three areas, the area of politics and hadith, the area of women and hadith, and the area of the Israelite narrations and hadith. Uh, these three areas are quite problematic when it comes to the hadith that is narrated. And by the way, I'm not talking about the sunnah. There is a difference between the sunnah and the hadith. The sunnah is what Muhammad said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or did. If Muhammad tells me something, of course I will do it. But I am not sure that this thing that I'm reading is what Muhammad said. I am thinking that there are some historical uh, impacts on the generations after generations until this thing appeared in Bukhari or Muslim or Ahmed or Muatta or any of the books of Ibadiyya or Shia. Or, now, this, what you are saying is a narration, and that is different from the Sunnah, because sometimes the narration is honest and therefore it represents the Sunnah, and sometimes the narration is altered, uh, and therefore it does not represent the Sunnah. Just quickly, um, now, if you look at the rise and fall of the Ummah, uh, something I researched a little bit, because when I deal with history, in the context of fiqh even, you find that our history is written in terms of the dynasties that ruled the Muslim world. And that is an important factor, but that's not how you divide history from a Quranic perspective. The Quran talks about the truth. And therefore the rise and fall of the Ummah is how we rose and, fought and fell with the truth. Whether there were palaces or not, whether the kings were rich and they had golds and uh, ornaments or not, it's not, it's not important from the Islamic perspective. What is important is whether these kings were just or not, whether they defended Islam or not, whether they stood with the truth or not. And therefore we should redivide our history in a way where we classify or reclassify the political structures uh, based on whether they were shaitanic or uh, Quranic, rather than whether they were rich or might uh, that, that is not how Islam uh, looks or the Quran looks at history and the ummah and the role of the ummah. And therefore, our rise and fall depends on how much we achieve the objectives of the ummah. Maqasid al ummah. The ummah has an objective to be, for example, witnesses over humankind. We should witness the truth over humankind. We should be the, um, the standard, if you wish, the index of truth and freedom and cleanliness and health and um, progress and whatever, you name it. But 
uh, we not all, we're not always like that. Sometimes we are the standard, and sometimes we are below the standard, and we take our standards from others. Islam before Muhammad وسلم, is an integral part of the history of the Ummah. Uh, we should not think that Islam is just Muhammad and after وسلم. Islam is from Adam, as I mentioned. That view of history would redefine Islamic history. Now, and then Muhammad's era, وسلم, we should uh, understand in terms of Sirah, the best book of Sirah is the Quran. Uh, and then the Quran judges the other books of Sirah, which we have. Uh, from the, you know, Aban ibn Uthman ibn Affan and his uh, student Muhammad ibn Ishaq and ibn Hisham, and you have other lines of uh, Zuhri, etc., and you have other lines, you know, when you start to read the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, you start to see human biases. Uh, the place where the seerah has no human bias is the Qur'an. That is the criteria, and there is a lot of seerah in the Qur'an. Now, I do not call it the era of uh, guided Khalifas, even though they were the greatest of our uh, companions, uh, but I call it the era of, uh, 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 of following and deviations. Uh, why? Because this is an era where some people followed the Prophet وسلم, and wanted to be muttabi'een, in fattabi'uni, uh, follow. And some people deviated. And that's when we started to see the different sects, uh, starting with, you know, the, uh, the what called the Sunnah al Jama'a sect, and then the Tashayu, um, and the, the uh, and so forth. You, you will find many sects that appeared in Islam different from the companions and how they saw. Uh, you, you see, you, you will start to see deviations. And you start to see people with mixture of truth and falsehood. Um, the following and the deviations is a very important era to study. And it had an impact, as I mentioned, on narrations and fiqh and so forth. And then you will enter into an era where there is always tadafa, you know, another universal law, at tadafa. There is always truth and falsehood colliding in history. Uh, the here, following and deviations. Here, civilization and tyranny. You will find tyrannical systems that um, wanted to uh, use the public uh, funds and the public authority for their own uh, tribal kind of benefit. And you will find uh, other forces that were trying to build a civilization. Uh, there is a big difference between different leaders that we read about in history. al Ma'mun, for example, was one of those leaders who wanted to build a civilization. You could differ with some of his political opinions, but his building of Bayt al-Hikmah, or the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, was a major landmark in our Islamic history from a Quranic perspective, because the Quran is calling us for Imarat al-Ard, Imran, civilization. And therefore, uh, we had a strong point with for example, Al Ma'moon, because we were building civilization. In the era before Ma'moon, we had a strong point with Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, uh, Rahimahullah, and because he wanted to build a civilization, he wanted to build a society. It was not about him and golden palaces and um, concubines, it was about building a civilization. And that is important in the study of history, all the way to the start of the decline in my uh, estimate from the middle of the fourth century to the really major decline in the middle of the seventh century, Hijri, with the Mughals uh, attacking Muslims from the east and the French from the north. So if we're talking about the history of the Ummah, that ended with what we call uh, colonization, what we should call still call colonization. And that colonization has changed the definition of Islam and has attacked the major institution of education and health and um, economy in Islam, which is al-awqaf, the endowments. The, the colonizers, when they attacked the, uh, the awqaf or the endowments, that is when you saw the Islamic civilization decline and the ummah decline, because without awqaf, we don't have hospitals as, the, as we had them in the past. The hospitals become a business. Uh, health, people's health become a business or becomes, uh, you know, a, a polit political game. And that was not how the awqaf saw it. Without awqaf, you don't have education that is truly independent because al-awqaf is actually was, was spending on 
the educational institutes and giving people scholarships and so on, not for a particular ideology, a national or regional or whatever ideology, it was actually for the sake of knowledge itself. Uh, without Awqaf, you don't have free markets proper because the Awqaf built the souks or the markets uh, that where people go and buy and sell and the markets were not monopolized the way we saw. So I'm talking history, but you see, you have to connect with economics, you have to connect with politics, you have to look in a wider scope so that uh, this would be a Quranic perspective. The Quran doesn't deal with the silos of disciplines. And finally, revival and fragmentation, which is what we see now. Uh, you, you would know this as much as I do. History of Islam pre-Muhammad is one of the needed research. Uh, we need to rewrite uh, the history of humanity from the Islamic point of view. And of course, we had a lot of that in our history, Ibn Hazm and, and others, but we need to rewrite. We need to look at the history of others, uh, not as others, as our history that is deviated. The history of Musa, the history of Isa, this has been rewritten in a way that is not Islamic. We need, we need our version of that, of that history of Islam pre-Muhammad. Uh, the history of Islam in the region is very important. Uh, I uh, taught in the, the Malay region in different countries, uh, spent quite some time uh, over the years. And I think there is a great weakness in the writing of history of that region where you are. Uh, the history of the Malays, the history of the Javanese, uh, the history of Islam in what we call today Indonesia and Thailand and Philippines and um, Malaysia and Brunei and, 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 and all of these na national countries, that is fine. But we need to research that history because without history, if you think that Islam is alien to East Asia, then you don't understand the history of East Asia. And I said the same thing in Africa to some African students the other day giving a lecture. They said, well, historically, we've been Christian. I said, what? No. Africa knew Islam before Medina knew Islam, you, you see. But we have not written this history of Islam in Africa. Uh, and we need to write that. Uh, Christianity and Africa are antithesis, really, like just to be frank. Uh, what is this? Uh, uh, we, 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 hi, hi, history of Africa. Uh, is, is a Christian history. So we need to uh, write uh, history in the, in the regional uh, existences of Muslims. And finally, we need to highlight the contributions of the Islamic civilization. Uh, and I mean by that, the civilization that was uh, inspired by the Quran. So that's post-Muhammad, that is not in total, but I'm talking about particularly post-Muhammad and the civilization that without which we would not have had the enlightenment uh, of Europe, we would not have had so much that humanity has today. And this is simply omitted from the history books in the secular sense. Um, we, humanity doesn't know these people who uh, built a great part, they call this the dark ages and stuff, but I mean, because we have not called them the light ages uh, enough. So uh, I am hoping that uh, this just introductory remarks uh, would um, hopefully give you some ideas. And uh, I am um, looking forward to uh, a discussion with uh, my colleagues here and then with the students Q&A. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. You're on mute, Sidi. You're on mute. Uh, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jasser, for this uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, even though in some points I have to differ with you. For example, sure. I mean, uh, uh, you said that the Quran uh, is not a history book. I tell to my, 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 my students, for me as a historian, Quran is a religious and historic book at the same time, in a number of ways. It, it teaches us uh, religion, the revealed knowledge, and at the same time, it's a historical document and has histories. But then you, you came into it, and I believe we came to the same agreement. And uh, it was wonderful. Uh, I mean, I took notes of what you were saying, and I have uh, uh, ordered, dictated to my students, like, like a caliph. I told them you have to take notes and to give summaries 
uh, for what you said uh, when I have class with them next week and there they do not. And <clears throat> among others, I very much like your classification of the castles and I loved very much your, uh, I mean, uh, statement that history in the Quran is not uh, only Arab and is not human centered. I mean, I, I didn't think about it. It was really enlightening. And I like very much your, 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 your uh, perspective that uh, the Quranic perspective is not about the history of uh, dynasties, but uh, the, I mean, according to Islam and Quran, we classify the past, uh, the powers of the past, if they were Islamic or uh, uh, shaitanic. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really impressed by, by everything that you said, but uh, before doing, I mean, going any further into the discussion, I would like probably to ask uh, uh, Dr. Alvi if you want to uh, jump in or, uh, or should, I, should I continue with the questions? Uh, Dr. Alvi. Can you hear me? We can hear you, uh, Dr. Alvi. Dr. Alvi. You? Uh, you're on mute, uh, Dr. Alvi. Can you hear us? Uh, you're asking me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yes. you. Yes, we. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm really sorry. I think I have problem with uh, networks. Um, so I. Uh, in the beginning, it's okay, but in the last part, uh, the, the, the sound, the voice sometimes appear in my computer, sometimes not. So uh, I just want to make sure. Uh, Dr. Alsi, you you asking me to... Uh, yeah, do you want to uh, add something? You want to discuss yeah, something? Yeah, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, because I, 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 I didn't hear before. All right. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Prof uh, Auda for uh, a very good talk tonight, inspiring, I think. Uh, usually when we talk about, I mean, I, I sometimes also curious, yeah, personally uh, want to know um, uh, about, about Quranic, what the, what the Quran talk about, about history actually, um, because actually many parts of the Quran relate to, we can say, relate to, to, to history when, when talk about the prophet and so on. Uh, and um, of course, uh, the Quran is, uh, as, as Prof. Auda mentioned, is higher than, than science, yeah? So it is not, uh, some people would, would, uh, would uh, criticize the Quran because it is not very structured, not very structured, quote unquote, yeah. Uh, but it is because of uh, the nature of the Quran. And uh, of course, when we want to know more about, about history, for example, from the Quran, we, we, we cannot. I just can, can, yeah, we, we cannot, we cannot um, uh, uh, get, um, I mean, uh, directly, yeah, uh, as a structure of, I mean, something like a book of history. Uh, however, when, I mean, from, from uh, uh, your talk, Prof. Auda, tonight, um, I mean, you, 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 you talk about framework. I think that's a good invitation, yeah, for, for us to, uh, to study about, about, about what is history uh, in the Quran. And um, other things, um, what I think is also uh, important, um, you know, when uh, today actually we are in the, in, in, uh, the Ummah is in difficult situation, we are in, in, uh, generally in decline yeah, and civilization dominated by, uh, by the West. Um, uh, and, and you also mentioned that and this also generally uh, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, history uh, wrote by written by the the, the, the victor, yeah. And uh, because of this situation, we are bombarded with many uh, kind of history which is now written from Islamic point of view, and it create confusion uh, among, among the ummah. And I think because of this situation, we as uh, Muslim need to uh, refer again and again back to the Quran as our, mm -hmm. as our source, yeah? Uh, 
uh, to, 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 to get guidance. I think this is uh, very important. And one um, other thing, actually talking about, about history and the Quran, I think um, it's a very big uh, topic. We can, we can uh, I mean, uh, one hour, two hours, not, not enough actually for us. I just want to highlight one uh, one thing um, uh, that I have in my mind, yeah, um, and um, I think this is important because when I hear a talk from from someone like Prof. Uh, Auda, uh, we become reminded yeah to this thing. We, uh, I mean. Many people tend to see a civilization in its physical aspect. Yeah, many people tend to see civilization in uh, its uh, physical or material uh, aspect. While when when we uh, read the Quran, we uh, in in many parts of the Quran we see uh, uh, how the Quran. Uh, portray civilization in an, an maybe I can say in an antagonistic way. I mean, <laughs> in many cases, uh, great civilization become the enemy of of uh, the prophets, yeah, and they got punished because because of that. Of course, we do not say that um, uh, the Quran uh, against the idea of civilization, but I think what is uh, Underlined by the Quran is uh, how um, civilization can uh, go into trouble when they focus only on its physical and uh, material aspect. And uh, of course, the Quran do not against uh, of this thing, but uh, it, actually, the Quran I think underlined. There is another thing which is more important, yeah. The, the 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 spiritual, if I can say like that, the spiritual aspect, uh, and and um, it's supposed to be in line, both of them, yeah. It's supposed to be in line, but at the same time, I think the Quran also warn us that there is a, a pos great possibility, maybe if I can say like that, a temptation, maybe, yeah, when civilization become great. Uh, they tend to be, I mean, pay attention more and more to, to its physical and, and, and uh, material aspect and tend to forget uh, the other thing, which is uh, important. I think um, uh, this is why um, for me, yeah, to, to, to study about, about history, and from Quranic perspective, is very very important. Uh, however, thank you very much for a nice talk, uh, Prof. Auda and Mashallah. I think that's I my, my my comment for tonight. <laughs> Allah bless you. Yeah. Can I comment, uh, Dr. Olsi? Sure, the floor is yours, sir. Barakallah fi. Well, Zakallah uh, khair. I I agree with you totally. Actually, there is a kind of uh, uh, antagonism uh, in the Quran from. Uh, what the Quran calls the zukhruf or the ornaments of the world. Um, but that is because the Quran defines civilization differently. Uh, civilization is, it, the closest word would be al-imran or al-islah. So to, to really, to have imara, to have architecture, uh, yes, is an objective, but it's more important for this architecture to be in the betterment of the world islah and not if said not corruption so you're building a palace is this for the truth or for the falsehood if it's for the truth then it is glorified but people who carry the truth don't build many palaces i mean they they just live and and you know and falsehood um is is not glorified in that sense um and 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 at the end al asr in that insan ala fi khusr this is fantastic in terms of history. You know, at the end, uh, it's all going to a loss. Except for those who believe and do good deeds. And therefore, it's a different take on civilization. So when we say Islamic civilization, I don't mean the uh, palaces and the music. And, like I mean the, the truthful part of that, which is 
the science, the welfare of the human. Uh, when you read about Baghdad, when the, when the Mughals came, Baghdad was living the highest level of civilization. Uh, the books, the intellectual, the, the, the mosques were full. People had the Islamic culture as their culture um, in terms of marriage, in terms of trade. And, and that is a very high level of culture. Um, so, but, but the civilization could not stand the attack because it was politically corrupt, because of the palaces that were full of gold that could not give enough salaries to the soldiers to defend Baghdad. So that is when the civilization crumbled on itself because it could not protect itself and as carriers of the truth. So I, I totally agree with you that, but I, and then when people say that the Quran is not very structured, no, 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 they don't understand. Um, ask them to learn Arabic. I mean, if they are going to speak about the Quran, ask them to learn Arabic and then ask them to open this book and read and see the incredible structure. But it's not a structure like human beings. It's not chapters and sections. And it is not, uh, uh, you know, groups of po verses in a poetry. It's not like that. It's, it's a fantastic structure for those who have the feel of the language and know when we move from a story to a different story, that is not random. Both stories are related, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a point to move from this story to this story and then back to the original story. Um, just reading this morning in Surah An-Naml, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I notice, is alternating between the hereafter and the dunya. Um, uh, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they will not be speaking in the hereafter. And then the next verse, So from the hereafter, the next verse is talking about day and night. And then the next verse, And then the horn will be blown. After talking about day and night, and then the horn will be blown, and then what are al talking about mountains, and then back to the hereafter. And I wondered, since I'm going to be talking about history, this there is no time here. We are one verse is talking about the afterlife, and then one verse is talking about day and night in our life, and then the afterlife, and then back to the mountains in our life, and then the afterlife, and then back to the the truth in our life. The concept of time. That is not lack of structure. That is a different concept of time. Uh, and, and that is when you read with those eyes, you, you realize that the Quran is giving us incredible messages. Uh, I agree with you. Zakallah khair. Barakallah khair. Dr. Auda, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Dr. Alda, because I think we had uh, like a, a short uh, disconnection from you. Uh, anyhow, uh, <coughs> can I'm you here. hear me now? I'm here, sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm, I'm here, alhamdulillah. Uh, Dr. Alda? Yes, yes, I am here. I'm here, can you Okay, can great. You uh, Dr. Okay, thanks. Because we had like a slight internet problem connection. Uh, 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 yes. Yeah, well, I can hear very well. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I can. Okay, uh, Dr. Alda, thank you very much for your explanation, and uh, I want to thank even Dr. Alvi for his uh, Ibn Khaldunian approach to civilization. I mean, I share with uh, Dr. Alvi his view that I mean, like Ibn Khaldun says. I mean, uh, you know what I, I tell to every 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 Muslim uh, historian and scholar. I tell to my students. If you want to learn about Islam, I tell them after the Quran, you have to read Ibn Khaldun. Uh, and uh, and uh, I mean, his approach towards uh, the civilization, uh, uh, which is very problematic when it grows because of the luxury, because of the corruption, the people forget God. So I'd like to thank Dr. Alvi for, for his point on that. And uh, now, uh, before I do some comments on you, we have some questions. So, sure. I mean, if you don't mind, I want to read them for you and if you can Please. respond. So first is uh, Nick Hayratur, my student. She is having a question and she says, 
does Western culture admit the success of Islamic golden era? Um, yes, they, they do, but they don't know. Uh, you see, I, I live in, uh, in Canada here in, in Ottawa. Um, mo most Canadians don't really don't read this at school. They, don't, they, they have never heard the name um, Jabir ibn Hayyan or Khawarizmi or uh, Ibn Rushd or Ibn Sina or they don't know that they read Aristotle because of Ibn Rushd, because Averroes and without Averroes they would not have known Aristotle. They don't know that they do chemistry because of Jabir ibn Hayyan and without Jabir ibn Hayyan whom they, they call father of history, father of chemistry, we would not have chemistry today and without Al Khawarizmi his name, Al-Khawarizmi, algorithm. We would not have algorithms today. They don't know that. But when they know, they, um, they admit. They, I mean, many people who are non-Muslims in the West, I, I live in the West, are truthful people. They, they, but they are not in the decision-making stratas of the society. The society, there are people who control education and politics and economics. And there are average people. Average people are decent uh, in, in many cases. In Europe, in here, they might have issues of racism. They might have some uh, moral issues, but they are decent people. The problem is in the system, the educational system that does not teach the history in a balanced way um, because they uh, would like to attribute Western civilization to the Greek civilization and not the Islamic civilization. And there are professors who want to attribute the Western civilization to the Islamic civilization, but they lose their academic jobs and they become marginalized because they are teaching the wrong version of history. Um, similarly, I saw this also in some Islamic universities. When you start to teach something that goes against the mainstream uh, view, and if there is openness to critique and stuff, then it works. But many people also lose their positions when they start to teach things that are not in, uh, in, in the media's interest and the economy's interest. So, and I don't advise my uh, students and my brothers and sisters in Malaysia, for example, who did not live in the West, I don't advise you to classify the world into Islam and the West. Islam is not against the West. Islam is against anti-Islam or non-Islam. Uh, and the West is not against the East. It's not about that. It, when you say Western uh, governments, yes, Western governments are mostly corrupt, actually, in a different way. They're democracies, and therefore they are not, uh, you know, the, your, your good old dictatorships anymore. But, but they are also corrupt. And we see that. We know that. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the West as a civilization or as a people are necessarily corrupt. Uh, no, I mean, people are people wherever they are. So just a little bit of nuance there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Auda. <coughs> and uh, uh, I mean, I want to, uh, in a way, uh, support what you said before. I mean, why in the West uh, we don't speak about Islamic golden era because it is related to power. And uh, one of the first things <coughs> that uh, I teach my students, not only here in Malaysia, but even in, in Europe, in Albania, was I, when I was teaching them, was I tell them, please read George Orwell's 1984. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, George Orwell, I, I, I mean, I, I love him for, 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 for uh, I mean, he's one of the great, uh, greatest and brightest minds of a, a British civilization, if I can say. And I remember, I mean, what is the most, uh, what is the ABC of every historian, I believe, is uh, to read George Orwell and to read the, the party slogan that uh, Brian tells to Winston Smith when he says, there is a party slogan dealing with the control of the past. Repeat it, if you please. Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. Uh, 
So, <clears throat> I mean, uh, there are circles in the West who don't want to speak about the achievements of Islam, uh, because if they speak, then uh, Aristotle, he was not known if it was not for the Arabs and for the Abbasid, the enlightened uh, Abbasid caliphs, which, I mean, uh, which, uh, I mean, I'm teaching even Russian history. And uh, if we see the works of uh, Magdisi or Ibn Fadlan and their testimonies about the Russians and Khazars and Turks and others, I mean, you are amazed with these people, who they were. I mean, they were, they were the, 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 the Foucault, the Michel Foucault of our time, they were the Arabs. But they were not only Arabs because, <laughs> I mean, I want to add something because I, I see sometimes, and you also mentioned it, there is some kind of Arab bias, in, in, even in many, uh, especially in the Arab world because of Arab nationalism. Uh, very often we claim that with the Mongol sacking of the Baghdad, Islam finished. It's not true. Kemas, the Ottomans from, from the Balkans, Eastern Europe, I mean, uh, the center of Islam was transformed from Baghdad to, to, to Istanbul, to Constantinople. Huh? And we Muslims went to Hungary, to Budapest. Islam became a European religion. Uh, uh, we have another question, sir, <coughs> from- uh, Well, uh, Zakallah Khair, thank you for uh, yani, giving this uh, extra detail for our students here, thank you. Because yes, uh, Baghdad fell and North Africa and so on. But at the same time of this fall of the Islamic civilization, there was another rise in Europe, you mentioned the Balkans, uh, the areas in Asia, in Africa, there was a great kingdom at that time in West Africa. So uh, this is a very important clarification that even the rise and fall is complex. It's not a total rise or a total fall. At the time when the Andalus fell, uh, Constantinople was open at the same time. Exactly. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, sir, we have uh, another interesting question from uh, sure. uh, Noor Athira, and inshallah, I want to discuss with you even after uh, uh, this uh, lecture, this privately. Oh. <laughs> so she has a question, and she says uh, uh, that uh, you said that uh, some uh, uh, stories about Hadith and Sira contradict uh, with the Quran, and sometimes there is bias in these stories. And her question is, if Hadith and Sira contradicts with the story written in the Quran, how can we ensure that in the future, if we want to write the true history of Islam, we have, uh, we, we can write a factual, we have a factual information. Because as we all know, most Muslims nowadays re refer to uh, uh, use the Hadith to understand the Quran better. Uh, yes, um, the Quran uh, has to be the primary reference. And if there is a narration on the Hadith or the Seerah, the content of the narration has to be judged based on the content of the Quran first. It's not black and white. It's not every Hadith in every book, and it's not every book of Seerah, but some, some of the Hadiths are not in line with the Quran. Um, and some of the understandings of hadith are not in line of the Quran. You see, the Prophet said something, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the understanding is contradictory to the Quran. I mentioned in one of my books, the hadith in which the Prophet sallam, told the, the Sahabiya, Umm Humayd radiallahu anha, told her to pray at home, and it's better than praying in my mosque, he said. Uh, the hadith is narrated without the story, without, without the, the historical, like, context of the hadith. And therefore, some people interpret this hadith that it's always better for women to pray at home versus praying in the mosque. But the Sahabiyat prayed in the mosque all the time. How can we resolve this contradiction? The contradiction is resolved by other narrations of the same hadith in which Umm Humayd is complaining that her husband wants her to be at home with the children. Uh, and therefore, and she travels. And if you look at her last name as Sa'idiyah, Sa'adiyah is from Bani Sa'ada, Saqif al Bani Sa'ada, way out of Medina. So she used to walk for two hours to pray with the Prophet and leave the children at home. And therefore, this is not about every woman in every place and time uh, praying at home. This is about when the woman has small children or when she has, uh, you know, certain family circumstances, then she does not have to pray in the mosque. But otherwise, the mosque is welcoming her. This is the right understanding of the hadith. So sometimes the hadith is, misinter is misinterpreted. 
The Prophet did say that, but the narrators of the Hadith, um, some of them, you see, how do I know the rest from the other narrators? Some narrators cut the Hadith, you know, that scissor of Hadith is a very big scissor. So they cut the Hadith and, and then the narrator added, so therefore she went back to her home and prayed in the most dark and the most furthest point in her home until she died. فذهبت إلى بيتها فصلت في أبعد وأظلم بقعة حتى ماتت. You know that hadith says that. Like what is this? No, this is not about praying in a dark place or praying. What is this? This contradicts with the Quran and contradicts with the rest of the hadith. You see. So I am not saying. Of course, I'm not rejecting the hadith. I'm not rejecting the Sunnah. The Sunnah is is like the Quran. The Prophet Isaiah Allah told us to follow him, to follow what he says. But what he says is understood sometimes differently. One person understands that, well, if you have small children or if you have duties at home, then you can be at home. And another person understands, no, you are not supposed to be in the mosque. These are two different understandings. And sometimes the narration gets corrupted with the generations or even from the first generation, it gets corrupted. And that is a fact. Um, when this happens, the Quran corrects. So. And uh, yes. sir, uh, since uh, I am a professional historian here, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I teach to my students is about the primary and the secondary sources of uh, us historians. And uh, I mean, when it comes to hadith, uh, not all hadith is a primary source because uh, many hadiths are stories that people narrated. So, I mean, a job of a professional historian is to investigate the truth from the invented stories. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, I remember when I started my PhD work at European University Institute. So in the time I wanted to write about the politics of the Balkans uh, after World War I. And I had a very uh, great Jewish uh, supervisor uh, who, uh, he, and who, he's a great historian of Italian Renaissance. And I remember when I was discussing with my supervisor for many things, which I was wrong, and uh, he was listening to me and was telling to me, have you gone to uh, uh, the foreign office uh, documents in London to see how the facts were? So the work of a historian is to find the primary sources to investigate. And the, in a way, uh, the, the job of uh, historians of Hadith is also to investigate what is true and what is fake, because very often things that we know that like truth, they're not. Sir, we have another question uh, from uh, uh, Subhan al faqi and he says in the Quran, there are some explanations about the story of the origin of, of, of life or human life. But uh, as I know, there are some different tafsirs about it. So how should we understand the true history of the basic principles based on the Quran uh, with different tafsirs? Come on. We could have different tafsirs in the same framework. So uh, basically that Allah uh, the story of creation that Allah created Adam, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that uh, He created him and dignified him, uh, right? Um, that that is, and 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 made him live in heaven, and He created uh, Hawa or or his wife as well, uh, and that. They lived there and they were asked not to eat from the tree, but they ate from the tree. Allah sent them uh, to earth and told them, beware of the shaitan. Uh, he created Adam from mud, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, he, the mud went through phases, Allah says in the Quran. This could, could have different tafsirs at different times. The problem with Darwinism, for example, as a creed, Darwinism as a theory of, um, you know, generational evolution, that is, I mean, that, that this is a fact. People in Africa are dark, people in Europe are white. This is a fact that humans change with the environment. But it's not a fact, and in fact, it is false, for species to shift. Uh, this is not scientific to start with, and I did a little bit of science, I can say that. This is not scientific, uh, and this is not true from the Islamic point of view. This is a way 
of escaping the creation story. And therefore they say, well, there is Darwinists and creationists. As if, if you uh, believe in creation, then you don't believe in evolution at all, not, not even as a principle. And if you believe in evolution as a principle, you should not believe in creation. And that is false because yes, you can believe in creation and evolution as a principle, as a scientific theory, but not as a way of explaining creation of humans because humans are, we only have an evidence of humans turning to monkeys, not monkeys turning to humans. And that evidence is in the Quran. And uh, we, we don't know where and exactly that was, but it's in the Quran. But perhaps yeah. that's where they get the story from. Uh, but subhanAllah, uh, so what I'm saying is tafsirs are, are actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Arabic uh, text, he made it very general so that we can understand different tafsirs. I was speaking the other day about was sama abina'an and the heavens is a structure, bina, structure. So we can understand the structure at some point as galaxies and so on. Then we can understand it even more. Now we're talking about dark energy and dark matter and black holes and so on. We can understand the structure more as we develop more in knowledge. But he subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a very general term structure. So we know that it's a structure. So that is the beauty of the language of the Quran that it leaves the interpretation open. But nobody should come and say, no, that's not a structure. That is not, no, that is, again, is the Quran. So that's what I'm saying. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, since we were uh, talking about the evolution <coughs> for our students, I just want to mention that, uh, I mean, uh, there are Muslim scholars who talk about evolution. Ibn Khaldun, in his Al-Muqadimah, he explains the evolution of the human species from the worms to the birds. And he says, uh, uh, the, as far as we go from the ground, we find more sophistication in, 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 uh, in the creatures that God has created. Uh, the thing is, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the West, we had a civil war during the so-called time of uh, Renaissance. And there was a war between the Pope and the kings and intellectuals. And uh, as uh, Montesquieu said in his Persian letters, we have, when, when he was having uh, an imaginary debate with a, 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 a Persian friend, he was saying here in Europe, we have a Grand Mufti who has convinced our king that one plus one plus one equals, equals, equals one. So, I mean, Montesquieu and the, the intellectuals of Renaissance in Europe, they were joking with the popes and their concept of Trinity. But <clears throat> what happened in Europe, because of their internal civil war with the, with the Catholic Church. Now the rest of the ma mankind is, is suffering. And we have on one side those who claim to be Darwinist and secularists, and we have the others, the religious people, who very often in the West are ignored, are seen as being obscurantist, and we're having this kind of hegemonic discussion that we find in, in, in the West where religion is simply ignored. Sir, uh, because the time is running out, we have one final question from uh, Ina. I see, I Ina. see the, several questions on the chat. I, I could try to answer, please. Uh, so the, there is one, I mean, you can, you can ask if you want even more, but uh, I'm just, uh, I mean, uh, following uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, no, I will, uh, I, if you allow me, I will leave my email and uh, uh, okay, those who I did not get to answer their questions properly, they can uh, chat inshallah by Excellent. email. So uh, I, 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 hope we, I hope we can we can have you again inshallah in the future. But so we have this uh, question from Inas Ilias who says, is there any work done about history in the Quran in a Makassadic approach? Well, uh, this particular methodology that I uh, presented, um, I am not aware of historical studies that were done based on it, based on the Maqasid Institute uh, Maqasid uh, methodology. But of course, there is a lot of history that is written with the inspirations of the concepts of the Quran and with a wider scope. Like recently, for example, uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Shakir uh, has a book on Islamic history that is not just Arab centered, but it deals with Africa and the Malays, it deals with Islam in Europe. So Islamic history, but written in a wider geographic uh, sense. Uh, th there are revisions by many scholars these days 
uh, of uh, you know certain claims about the, the Islamic history. Uh, I I could send you some some links if we get in touch, inshallah. Inshallah, uh, Doctor Alvi, do you want to say something before we close? I I think uh, uh, enough from me. <laughs> I mean. Uh, uh, however, thank you very much for the for the talk. I think we we we, we learned a lot, yeah, from from uh, tonight's uh, talk, and uh, I think this uh, will um, increase our, uh, our our curiosity to 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 learn more, to study more about, to have discussion more, prof, uh, about about this thing. I think uh, thank you very much about. Allah bless you. Thank you. The pleasure was mine. And inshallah, the discussion continues. Uh, I left my email and I do answer students uh, when I get time. So no problem, inshallah, anytime. And for my colleagues here, we I'm looking forward to more and more, inshallah, seminars and discussions. I also learned from your remarks. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallahu feekum. Professor Jasser, thank you very much. You enlightened us a lot tonight. And uh, <clears throat> I hope uh, my students and this was our week when we spoke about uh, the Quranic concept of history, have learned things from you. Maybe, uh, maybe I've said things probably that uh, go contrary to what you have said. So I'm looking forward mm -hmm. next week to have a, a very serious intellectual debate with my students and uh, to see who is on the right track or not. Thank you very much to everybody, uh, to Professor Jasser Alda, who honored us with his presence from uh, Ottawa in Canada and uh, Dr. Alvi and uh, all the other colleagues who joined and probably remain silent in uh, this uh, link here and uh, all my students and other students from, from uh, uh, other departments who joined us. And uh, inshallah, we hope uh, one day after this crazy COVID quarantine regime that we're living throughout our planet, to have uh, Professor Jasser with us here in Kuala Lumpur and to have a live debate and so that he cannot escape our questions. Uh, so we will have no button to, to, to close his, 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 his mind. Professor oh, Jasser, you are fantastic. Thank you well, very well, much. Well, 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 thank you very much. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. thank you to uh, everyone. Thank, thank you to everybody. Thank you to everyone.